Well, our next speaker is Dr. Rob Kallenbach. Um, Rob is the State Extension Forage Specialist here at the University of Missouri. He's a professor of agronomy in the Division of Plant Sciences. He received his BS degree from Missouri State University, uh, his master's from the University of Missouri, and his uh, PhD from Texas Tech University. Well, he has published extensively, extensively, and he has led the Silva Pastoral Research for the Center for Agroforestry for many years. And he has won multiple awards. I'm not going to list all of them, uh, but he has received multiple awards at the university level, state level, and national level for his work. And today he is going to talk to us about making livestock systems climate smart using uh, silver pastoral, that is an agroforestry system, so silver pastoral approach. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kallenbach. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Today I do want to talk a little bit about silver pasture uh, and, its, and its use in climate smart uh, systems that we, can, that we might employ uh, in not only in uh, the Midwest but across the world to help with uh, climate change. Uh, just real quickly to kind of give you, sure so we're all on the same page about what silver pasture is, just a brief uh, description. Silver pasture is where we're really trying to take uh, the mix, purposely mixing trees and grasslands together with livestock systems to produce good quality trees and good quality livestock products from the same bit of land. Now there's two ways in which we approach this. We can approach it from one way of saying we're going to add some grass into the trees, okay, we'll talk about that, and the other way is we're going to add trees into the grass. But in either case, we're hoping to have some nice livestock products and tree products coming out the other end, okay? So there's two approaches, add trees to grass or add grass to trees, uh, but either way, we wind up uh, I think with some really interesting systems. Now I want to go through very quickly what the science, what the science tells us about these. I get a lot of questions about silver pasture and people say, well, who studied that or how do you know this thing? There's a lot of really great science that tells us that silver pasture makes some sense. And one of those things, just from the forage perspective, is, is that we know the cool season grasses do really well when they're in shaded systems. In fact, we get about the same amount of growth from cool season grasses, C3 grasses, tall fescue is the one we have the most of in Missouri, but lots of other C3 grasses, in about 50% shade as we do in full sunlight. That's gonna be important because we wanna produce grass in these systems for the livestock, and we wanna produce good quality trees, of course, for the forest products as well. Okay, we also know from that warm season grasses, mainly C4 species, they are much more shade intolerant, but there is a lot of variability in the C4 species, and there is an opportunity for us to select good C4 species to fit into silver pastoral systems as well, okay? A fair bit of work probably needs to be done in this area to really develop the right ones to fit well, but it is a possibility. The science also tells us, and this is, a, this is really a big deal to me here, is that Cool season grasses grow a little earlier in spring, a little longer into that early summer period, and a little longer in autumn in silver pastoral systems as they do when we don't have trees as being part of that. There's a couple of reasons for it, but the big reason is we get a sort of a microclimate effect. And that microclimate effect sort of flattens out what we would say is a, a forage production curve. And a little flatter curve means that we're able to produce forage that livestock can use for more days of the year and more days of grazing typically is better in these systems than fewer, okay? The science also tells us if we're gonna take that approach of adding trees into the pasture, that it's really pretty easy for us to protect those trees, but we need to do so, and that just taking some poly wire, just simple poly wire, about three or four feet away from the base of those trees and going around them, does a really nice job of protecting those trees and gets them off to a good start, okay? Very practical kind of thing. 
The other thing I will tell you, though, is that when we start to add trees into the pasture, they, the grasses themselves are tough, particularly tall fescue, is a tough customer in terms of competition. And we've got to think about how do we manage these different biological systems. We have at least three biological systems we're trying to keep track of here, trying to keep track of the tree, trying to keep track of the grass, and of course trying to keep track of the livestock. And there's probably more biological systems than even those, but that's the, that's the broad sense I would draw it in, okay? So we have to do something if we're going to add trees into the pasture, and I would just say that dealing with ground cover is an important issue, particularly when we're working with tall fescue. And I will say this, tall fescue is the grass that covers much of the region uh, where we have substantial beef production in the United States, okay? The science also tells us that if we do a good job, though, of holding back that competition, and it takes about a, we would say, a 1.2 meters or about seven foot zone around the base of particularly black walnut trees does a really good job getting those trees off to a, uh, a good start compared to not controlling that vegetation. Again, a very practical kind of thing, but very important as we begin to implement these systems to make them productive. Uh, and, and we'll get to some of that. We also know that irrigating or fertilizing young trees in silver pastures when we're adding the tree to the pasture helps that grass that's around there a lot but it doesn't do as much for the trees as we'd like for it to do, particularly, particularly if we don't have a good zone around the base of that tree where we've controlled the vegetation, okay? That's what the science tells us about growing these systems. I will tell you that pine trees are much less sensitive than are most of the deciduous trees to these kinds of effects. Again, trying to match all these biological systems tells me that if I don't have a good way of controlling vegetation and I want to add trees to the pasture, maybe a pine tree or some sort of uh, uh, would be a better choice for me than would some of the deciduous trees, okay? Now, thin forests, this is the opposite sort of thing. This is our word act farm if you've had a chance to go see it, and it's really a, a, an interesting thing where we have gone into a forest and thinned the forest some and added grass in there. I'll tell you the number one comment I get from producers about this one is, is that when they see that, they like that look. That's the first thing they see. They see that pasture and they say, you know, I don't know what's there, but I like that look. It looks like a park to me, all right? It looks like a park, but it's also a pretty productive park. Uh, and, and I will tell you that these, if we manage these things right, they can be very productive for us. If we manage them wrong, they can be disasters. And I want to make that right, clear, clear up front. You go through this thing and you do a bad job of logging it, and you do a lousy job of establishing the grass and get a lot of erosion, this will, can be a disaster. But we know there are some really great practices that we've been able to implement to make this successful. The neat, also, the neat thing about this pasture is, is that the best time of year to show that one off is in August. When everybody else is hot, you go walk up into the forest and it feels nice in there. And not only does it feel nice to you, but the stock notice the difference, and I'll show you some data on that in a moment. Okay. The science also tells us that silver pastures can sequester a lot of carbon. There's a, been a lot of papers that I've tried to read through looking at carbon sequestration from various agroforestry practices and, and with some focus on silver pasture. A lot of different kinds of estimates, but I will just tell you this, that silver pastures are good at this. Uh, here's just sort of some summary of data looking at pasture, forest, silver pasture, and then no-till corn and soybean looking at both the above and below ground carbon together, and I will just say this, that any of these perennial crops is better than even no-till corn or soybean, but silver pasture has some advantage in over even just either of those perennial crops alone. The science also tells us that stocker cattle gains are equal in open and in silver pastures for the first 10 to 20 years after planting, at least equal. And that, that's also important for us to know because uh, when we're working with livestock producers, if you tell them they're going to get less beef right now, then they're getting, they get sort of like the perennial grain question. You know, if you tell them, I don't have any grain this year, you've got to wait a couple of years to get it, or all these, that's, a, that's an issue for producers. We know that sucker cattle gains are really good in these kinds of systems. I'll show you some uh, more in-depth data on this in a little bit. We're trading cattle right now at record high prices, record high prices. I've, I've never seen the beef industry more profitable than it is right now. There's not enough cattle even to harvest, uh, 
to, to keep all the plants full. That's, and we're, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing time in that industry. And yet I have more interest now in working with silver pastures than we've ever had because people see the value in gain like they've never been able to see. Okay? And in fact, we know silver pastures can reduce the impact of tall fescue toxicosis, which is a major, at least a billion dollar problem in the United States annually, and silver pasture helps us with this because it helps us deal with heat stress in the animals. Look at this data here. This data comes from our Southwest Center, looking at uh, four different scenarios here. So we have infected tall fescue in the top two lines of this data. That is common. That's Kentucky third, Dirty 31, you might know it as, okay? Uh, but it, it's the grass that is most common in beef systems in, in, the, in the temperate, humid United States. And we had it one of two ways, either with trees or with shade and no trees, okay? And we looked at cow, then average daily gain, the percentage of animals that calve, and these are in cow-calf systems, and then the weight of those calves. Now, the bottom two lines of data are when we've changed the fescue from a toxic type of fescue to a non-toxic type. This is one of these actually novel endophyte infected tall fescues, the bottom two lines, again, with and without trees, as you can see, all right? Now, cow average daily gain, which is the, now I have trouble with right and left. So if I say something's on the right and it's not over there, just look on your other right and it'll be exactly there, I promise. But I'm pretty sure average daily gain's the middle column here, if I'm counting them right. Not a lot of difference in cow average daily gain over summer. But when we look at the percentage that calve, it's a big difference. Now, I, I'm not a good economist. And in fact, my, my economics friends like to make fun of my economics from time to time. But I do know this much, that I cannot sell calves that are never born. And I'm pretty sure of this, OK? And so when you look at percent calving, that's a big deal, all right? Uh, we're, where we're having shade in those pastures, we're getting, you know, upwards of 90% of those animals to drop a calf. That's good. That's good. Uh, when we don't have shade available for animals, you can say either in the infected tall fescue case, which is the top line, or the non-toxic one, third line down, substantially fewer calves being born, okay? And when we look at calf mass, this is the calf, this is what's being sold out of most of these systems. You can see calf weaning weights are lighter when we don't have shade as opposed to when we do, okay? Making, getting better grass is good, but getting trees as part of the system is also really in, important for us. So the science tells us that silver pastures can benefit animals not only during heat stress, I'll argue they help us a lot during cold stress as well, okay? And so and I'll show you some data on this as well, looking at what we call integrated Silva pasture systems. And so what we did in this particular work, this is actually done here in central Missouri, and I've shown some of this before, but I've put some new economics to it given the realities of where we are in the beef industry right now, looking at a traditional and an integrated system. Now, the traditional system is a, tr is a system where we have rotational stocking going on, but there are really no trees as part of that system, okay? In the integrated system, what I did was I just took 25% of the paddocks and we turned those into silver pastures, and I used those silver pastures at times of year when it really made some sense, when animals were under heat stress, okay, in the summertime, or in the wintertime, when we needed a windbreak, I could push them over there into the silver pasture, and that's, if you're outside today and the wind's blowing, we would all go to the trees if we could find them, all right? And so that's what my integrated system is. So it's just really in the integrated system, 25% of the paddocks include silver pasture, okay? What I measured then was cow body weight loss over winter. You see the value of that? That's that first column to your, to your left, I'm pretty sure. I'm, this makes an L. That's a helpful thing to me. All right. Percent calving with uh, difficulty in the middle area here. What we did is we measured animals that required assistance uh, in these two types of systems, particularly when we're doing fall calving, and that's what ha this happens to be in this case. Animals were being born in late, late summer to early autumn. I like, having it be able to, like being able to push animals into those silver pastures in late summer to calve because it's shady in there, and it, they require less assistance, and that has some real value to us. And then you can see the difference in calf weaning weight. There's about a, if I've done the math right, about a 25 kilogram, or roughly 50-pound difference in weaning weight. And the value of a pound of gain right now is about $1.47. 
Uh, so if you do it on a kilo basis, it's over $3 a kilo right now in terms of gain. So point is, when you put those bits together, you'll find that the livestock production benefits from this particular work shows that in integrated systems, we have less weight loss of animals over winter and less stress at calving and heavier calves. And in fact, when you look at the overall returns, we're able to, per cow-calf pair, turn out about $165 additional benefit just by converting a few of the pastures into silver pastures. So I, I'm the first person to realize, at least I hope I'm the, at least one of the people to realize, maybe I'm not the first, but I'm at least one of the people to realize that not every producer in the state is going to turn the entire pasture system into a silver pasture. We never said they would, okay, but let's, let's, let's assume that, the, uh, that that's not going to happen, and yet we know there's some strong benefits here because what I would like to be able to do from a climate perspective is to think about it in this way. We may have all this climate change. My silver pasture is a way for me to deal with, that, deal with these extremes because when I have animals up in the trees, it's not quite as cold in the winter and it's not quite as hot in the summer. And that's a good place to be. Uh, and so when I think about silver pasture systems, I like to think of us as integrating all the components that we know about in terms of animals and plants, both the forage and the trees, and soil and environment, and to develop some really site-specific applications of these things on a farm-by-farm -farm basis based on the conditions that you've got, okay? There, there won't be a system that I'm going to come up with, these, with that says, this works in Columbia, Missouri, and it's also going to work in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and Raleigh, North Carolina. Rather, what we have to do is use the science we know about to develop systems that fit what we need to get done. And so, in my view, silver pasture systems have to do at least these five things. The middle one there, obtaining economic return, is an important one, okay? My kids like to eat every single day, okay? I've tried. Not giving them some food. No, I haven't. Okay, but uh, we've, we've argued about that, Rachel and I have, okay? But perhaps number four on that list is the most important one. When we talk about developing systems that are climate resilient, our goal really needs to be on the people. And in terms of the people, providing the desired quality of life for managers in a way that allows them to have the kind of lifestyle they want and in a way that doesn't tear up the planet. And that's what we think these silver pasture systems can do, okay? Now, that requires a fair bit of management. Look on the far side of that graph over there. Here's a potential silver pasture system, okay, that's managed so badly that erosion is a, is a significant issue, okay? Overgrazing is still a concern. These aren't systems that, you know, we just put them in and walk away, okay? But they are systems that when we manage them right have some real benefits to us. Okay, so our long-term goal is to develop these, syst these systems that landowners or these principles that landowners can easily implement and profitably produce uh, the products that we talked about today. And so what I'm going to say is, is climate smart is really just two things. It's really good planning and it's really great implementation and management of those practices. And we know a lot about the science in silver pasture and, but it, for us to be able to make an impact with this practice across the globe, it's, it just comes down to a lot of uh, good production practices and educating people about here's what can work, here are the principles that fit into your system, here are the conditions that you've got, and, and here are the benefits that are then possible. Okay? But, and so that's where I'll leave today's uh, presentation, but if you've got questions, I'll try and answer them.
Yeah, I think this one's working here. Good. Uh, great presentation, Rob. Uh, so you you worked a lot with the, the uh, uh, for many years with the grazing schools and and training uh, individuals to do managed intensive grazing. And, and I'm wondering if if that target group of of uh, cattle producers is the most likely group to then take to another step to try to integrate trees once they already are familiar with the more intensive management. Right, that's a good, it's a good suggestion, Mike. Uh, probably our, our best chance to work with producers that, uh, in my view, is we have some advanced grazing schools where folks who've already been through a grazing school sort of have uh, had a chance to implement some of the sort of, I guess, basic practices on farm and come back and want to get some additional information, try to maybe uh, do something that's uh, perhaps a little bit different in terms of niche marketing or maybe they want to make some changes in the system with regard to uh, other production aspects. And to me, that's a group that I think that has maybe the, the best chance uh, of looking at something as unique as silver pasture and, and saying, what can I really do with this? And, and it's not that I don't think the average producer recognizes the value of shade. I think they recognize the value of shade. It's really just getting us to move beyond, I got a couple of shade trees out there in the pasture, and, and, and taking a look at it and say, what can I do with this in terms of uh, forest production? What can I do with this in terms of cow comfort in a, in a large scale? And, and really kind of capitalizing on the benefits other than just, oh, we left an oak tree over there. Good question. Yes. Um, outside of the local area, uh, how do you feed your technical resources out? I'm from Iowa. Um, are you recommend, recommendation of people who actually heard and understand and could give technical assistance on this kind of system? Right, so that's, that's we, we do get a number of questions. Uh, in terms of technical assistance, uh, we have had some uh, training events on silver pasture, certainly had some things at field days, like you, uh, we're talking about the uh, stuff we've done at the Word Act Farm, and we've even talked about silver pasture uh, at our Southwest Center where we've got some, where we've added sort of trees in the pasture, sort of the opposite sort of an impact, as well as some things uh, out at the uh, uh, Agroforestry Center at New Franklin. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, technical resources like, you know, guide sheets or websites, We've done some of those kinds of things, probably need to do more of those things as we go forward. Uh, it's, to this point, it's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation and with, with some events, as you, have you've spoken about. We, we'd like to take the educational aspects to a little, a little higher level, just need to come up with the uh, mechanism to do so. I don't, mean, I don't mean to be one of these people that always talks about money, but it does, it does make a difference. Done. Is it working? There you I can't go. Hear it. Have you done, or are you aware of using other livestock species like sheep, goats, pastured hogs, and how do those compare to the methods you're finding with cattle? Right. So um, it's a great question. What other species besides cattle have do we know about, and have, has there been work on? So. I don't know of any work with pastured hogs. There may be some of which I'm unaware, but I don't know about that. But in terms of sheep, quite a lot of work that gives very similar kinds of uh, impacts. Uh, look, anytime we can get livestock into a, a greater comfort zone, production aspects tend, tend to follow. And uh, when we have a silver pasture, we're dealing with heat stress areas or cold stress times. It, it, it follows pretty easily to other species. Uh, I do know of some work with goats. Uh, goats can be a challenge, particularly with young things, because they like to eat the trees before, and, and so we sort of get out of a tree business pretty fast if we're not careful about the protection aspects. Uh, in fact, sometimes goats are used to, uh, for brush control, and so that, it can be a good thing, or it can be a, something that we don't want to have happen, depending on how we manage it. Uh, beyond, beyond sheep, goats, and, and, and cattle, I'm unaware of any other work, but for, for those other species, they, you get similar trends for almost all those ruminants. Uh, <clears throat> and all these uh, pastures you have, there are rotational grazing. Oh, sorry. Rotational grazing quite a bit for uh, 
also probably to help you keep your uh, root uh, compaction around the soil. A lot of uh, foresters and especially uh, y'all have always told keep those cows out of there because it's going to tear up those roots and those trees. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your uh, you did on that? Right. So it's good. It's a, it's a, it's a good observation, Kenny. Uh, we have used a lot of rotational stocking in these. Uh, for some of the benefits that you mentioned. I will just say this, that for people who worried about livestock tearing up trees, I'd say two things. First of all, if you've got good grass there, that'll help a lot, right? Because um, uh, when the grass, perennial grasses form a, a sod, it, it's helpful in terms of not getting a lot of compaction. It's helpful in terms of not tearing up tree roots. The other thing I noticed about cattle when we turn them off into the trees sometimes is that if there is no grass, they try to eat what they can, and if there's no grass, they eat the leaves off the trees and they tear the bark up, and it's, it's, a, it's a significant issue. We wouldn't consider that really silvopasture. At least I wouldn't consider it silvopasture. I call that, frankly, bad management of cows in the trees. Uh, so that said, rotational stocking is something that helps us in terms of we have an intense period of use well, where the forage is used, manure is deposited by the animals, reasonably well spread across the system, and then the animals are gone for a while. And that, that, that while is until we've had sufficient regrowth in the forage that we can withstand another grazing event. But, uh, but can you overgraze in a silva pasture? Absolutely. It's easy to do, okay? It's, easy to, it's always easy to overgraze. It's easy to undergraze, too. But it's always easy to manage badly. But I would just say this, that in silva pastures, the same principles that apply with regard to forage management in an open pasture typically apply in the trees as well. 